Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email address is sriklpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting disorder, spinal cord disorders and paraplegia part 1, the localization of the lesion. Spinal cord disorders and paraplegia part 1, the localization of the lesion. Spinal cord disorders and paraplegia. In a small cross sectional area, almost the entire motor output and sensory input of the trunk and limbs are present and therefore diseases of the spinal cord are devastating. The knowledge of the anatomy and the clinical features of the spinal cord diseases is required for the successful localization of spinal cord disorders. Clinical anatomy. The spinal cord is an extension of the CNS in contained within the bony spinal canal. It originates at the medulla and continues caudally to the conus medullaris at the lumbar level. The adult spinal cord is enlarged in the cervical and lumbar regions because they have to supply the upper limbs and the lower extremities respectively. So the adult spinal cord is enlarged in the cervical and lumbar regions where neurons that innervate the upper and lower limb respectively are located. The white matter containing the ascending sensory and descending motor pathways are located peripherally whereas nerve cell bodies are present in the inner region of grey matter that surrounds the central canal anatomically an extension of the fourth ventricle. The spinal cord has 31 segments each defined by an exiting ventral motor root and entering dorsal sensory root. This diagram is very very important and essential to understand the various causes of paraplegia and localization of paraplegia. The transverse section of the spinal cord. You can see here on the one side we have the sensory tracts and on the other side we have the motor tracts. The two important tracts which we need to know is the posterior column tracts which are placed posteriorly and the spinothalamic tracts which are placed laterally. The posterior column tracts carry the touch position joint vibration sense. They ascend but cross at the level of the medulla oblongata towards the opposite side. Whereas the spinothalamic tract which carries the pain and temperature sensation ascends and immediately crosses over within just one or two segments to the opposite side and then ascends. And therefore any lesion in the center of the spinal cord will affect the traversing spinothalamic tract but spares the posterior column which does not traverse the spinal cord but ascends and crosses at the level of the middle oblongata. So any lesion in the center of the cord like syringomyelia will affect the traversing spinothalamic tracts and therefore the sensations carried by the spinothalamic tract namely pain and temperature are affected but posterior column sensations are spared. This is known as dissociated sensory loss, dissociation of sensations. Associations means coming together. So a person with syringomyelia wherein there is a cavity in the center of the spinal cord will affect the crossing spinothalamic tract fibers and therefore pain and temperature are lost but the position vibration, joint and touch sensations are spared which are carried by the posterior column. Very interesting. So dissociated sensory loss, the answer should be the syringomyelia. A person with syringomyelia, it is very interesting. They may not appreciate the pain sensation when they keep their hands unknowingly in the fire. But someone touches them, they can feel it. Normally, we will be able to feel the pain sensations better because someone pinches, I immediately withdraw my hand. But here are the persons with syringomyelia wherein they cannot appreciate the pain sensations even if they keep it in the burning in the fire. This is known as dissociated sensory loss. And another important concept of the spinothalamic tract fibers are that spinothalamic tract immediately cross over to the opposite side. So the lower limb fibers crosses over and goes to the peripheral most, then the trunk fibers and then the upper limb fibers. So in spinothalamic tract, 
the lamination is that the sacral fibers are placed lateral most and the upper limb fibers are placed medial most. So if there is an any lesion coming from the outside of the spinal cord and compressing the spinal cord like an extra medial lesion, it first affects the peripherally placed sacral fibers. So they will have sacral sensory loss. Whereas if it is an intramedial lesion coming from the center of the cord and then expanding, it will first affect the upper limb fibers and the sacral fibers are last to get affected or will not get affected. So this is known as sacral sparing. And if an extra medial lesion comes, it first affects the sacral fibers, then the thoracic, then the upper limb fibers. So it is like an ascending paresthesias. If it is an intramedial lesion, first the upper limb fibers get affected, then the lower limb fibers. So it will be like a descending paresthesias. These are the very, very important concepts of the spinothalamic tract. One, it cross over to the opposite side immediately. And therefore, when there is a lesion of the spinal cord in the center of the spinal cord, like syringomyelia, it affects the sensations carried by the spinothalamic tract but spares the sensations carried by posterior column which is known as dissociated sensory loss. So pain is affected but touch is spared. Second, in the spinothalamic tract because of crossing over to the opposite side, the sacral fibers become the peripheral most and the upper limb fibers become the medial most. Right. Posterior column is placed posteriorly and spinothalamic tract is placed laterally. Then we have another tract which is not as important as spinothalamic tract or posterior column which are known as the spinocerebellar tract. It basically carries the proprioception uh, information at a subconscious level. So this is all about the sensory tracts. Now we will come to the motor. Motor are the dissenting tracts. Two important tracts are the corticospinal tracts which are important for the supply of the muscle groups. So corticospinal tracts to begin with the upper limb fibers are laterally placed and the lower limb fibers are medially placed. They cross at the level of the medial oblongata and go to the opposite side. So upper limb fibers which are placed laterally becomes medially and the lower limb fibers which were placed medially now becomes laterally. As you can see in the diagram, the lower limb fibers have become lateral and the upper limb fibers have become medial after crossing over. But before crossing over, the upper limb fibers were lateral and the lower limb fibers were medial. And therefore, before crossing over, if there is a lesion at the level of the medial oblongata, it first affects the upper limb fibers on one side, lower limb fibers on the same side, then the lower limb fibers on the opposite side and then the upper limbs on the opposite side. So a U-shaped weakness is seen which is known as Ellsberg's phenomenon. Very important about the corticospinal tract and corticospinal tract has got proclivity for distal muscles and some muscle groups in the upper limbs and the lower limbs. Right. Vestibulospinal tract is slightly medially placed as you can see in the diagram. Vestibulospinal tract is responsible for maintaining an extension posture. So if there is a lesion coming and affecting the spinal cord, an incomplete spinal cord lesion, it spares the vestibulospinal tracts and therefore vestibulospinal tract since if it is intact, it will result in an extension posture which is known as paraplegia in extension. But if the lesion completely affects the spinal cord, if there is a complete transverse section of the spinal cord, it affects also the vestibulospinal tract. So vestibulospinal tract now can no longer maintain an extension posture, so it will result in paraplegia and flexion. So an incomplete lesion will cause paraplegia and extension, a complete lesion will cause paraplegia in flexion. These are all very very important concepts regarding the spinal cord. And the entire spinal cord as you, as I uh, will be dwelling shortly from now about the blood supply, the entire spinal cord is supplied by the anterior spinal artery except the posterior column which is supplied by the posterior spinal artery. So when the anterior spinal artery is involved, all the tracts of the spinal cord get affected except the posterior column. Right. Another important concept is that there is a discrepancy between the roots and the vertebral bodies. During embryologic development, growth of the cord lags behind that of the vertebral column and that the mature spinal cord ends at the level of the L1 vertebral body. The lower spinal nerves take an increasingly downward course to exit via the intervertebral foramina. The relationship between the spinal cord segment and corresponding vertebral bodies are as follows. The spinal cord level and corresponding vertebral body. Because the spinal cord ends at the level of the L1, there is a discrepancy. So the spinal cord levels related to the vertebral bodies, spinal cord level, corresponding vertebral body. Upper cervical same as cord level, lower cervical one level higher, upper thoracic two levels higher, lower thoracic two to three levels higher. The T10 to T12 will have all the lumbar spinal cord segments and the vertebral body at the level of T12 and L1 will have all the sacral segments.
again there is a discrepancy between roots and vertebral bodies because there are only seven cervical vertebral bodies but eight cervical roots because of that there is a discrepancy the first seven pairs of the spinal nerves exit above the same numbered vertebral bodies that is c1 above c1 and c2 above c2 whereas all the subsequent nerves exit below the same numbered vertebral bodies because of the presence of eight cervical cord segments but only seven cervical vertebrae so the c7 exits above the c7 but c8 exits above t1 and therefore now t1 starts going below t1 because of this discrepancy at the at the cervical level it exits above the respective vertebral body below the cervical level it exits below the corresponding vertebral body the presence of a horizontally divide, defined level below which the sensory motor and autonomic function is impaired is a hallmark of a lesion of the spinal cord sensory loss below this level is the result of damage to the spinothalamic tract on the opposite side one to two segments higher in the case of a unilateral spinal cord lesion and at the level of a bilateral lesion because even the roots get affected the discrepancy in the level of a unilateral lesion is the result of the course of the second order sensory fibers which originate in the dorsal horn and ascend one or two segments levels as they cross anterior to the central canal to join the opposite spinothalamic tract lesions that transect the descending corticospinal and other motor tracts causes paraplegia or quadriplegia with heightened deep tendon reflexes babinski sign and eventual spasticity that is upper motor neuron syndrome transverse damage to the cord also produces autonomic disturbances consisting of absent sweating below the cord level and bowel bladder and sexual dysfunction the uppermost level of the spinal cord lesion can also be localized by the segmental signs corresponding to the distorted motor or sensory innervation by an individual cord segment a band of altered sensation hyperalgesia or hyperpathia at the end of the upper sensory disturbances fasciculations or atrophy in the muscles innervated by one or several segments or decrease or absent reflex may be noted at this level so at the level there will be lmn signs below the level there will be umn signs above the level it is normal we'll take the example of c7 triceps so in the c7 well, at the level of the c7 the c7 anterior horn cells levels are affected so triceps jerk is absent but below the level l2 l3 and s1 the anterior horn cells are intact but the cord is affected at the level of the c7 so for them the corticospinal tract innervating l2 l3 and s1 are lost so the knee jerk and ankle jerk become exaggerated the biceps is subserved by c5 so it is normal so simple rule is that at the level there will be lmn signs below the level there will be umn signs above the level of the lesion it is normal spinal shock with severe and acute transverse lesions the limbs initially may be flaccid rather than spastic known as spinal shock which may last for several days yeah blood supply of the spinal cord the sub the spinal cord is supplied by a single anterior spinal artery and paired posterior spinal arteries a single anterior spinal artery is formed by the union of arterial branches that pass cordially from each vertebral arteries and unite in the midline near the foramen magnum it supplies the entire spinal cord except the posterior part where the posterior columns lie they are supplied by the posterior spinal arteries so the paired posterior spinal arteries they also arise from the vertebral arteries and posterior medullary arteries join them at irregular intervals they supply the posterior part of the spinal cord where the posterior columns lie there's a reinforcement by medullary arteries which are branches of in the cervical region ascending cervical artery thorax by the intercostals abdomen lumbar iliolumbar and lateral sacral arteries the largest medullary artery the great anterior radicular artery of adam kiewicz arises between t9 and 12 the upper thoracic segments near t4 have been traditionally thought particularly vulnerable to ischemia so this is the arterial supply of the spinal cord the entire spinal cord is segment is supplied by the anterior single anterior spinal artery the posterior column are supplied by the posterior spinal arteries these are reinforced by medullary arteries coming from the intercostal artery which gives rise to the anterior radicular artery and the posterior radicular artery so they get reinforced by the intercostal arteries yeah now we'll talk about the localization of level at each spinal cord level localization of lesion at each spinal cord level uh, upper cervical cord 
the upper cervical cord lesions produce quadriplegia and weakness of the diaphragm the uppermost level of the weakness and reflex level with the lesions at c5 c6 biceps jerk is lost c7 triceps finger and wrist, wrist extension is lost c8 finger and wrist flexion is lost lesions at any level of the cervical cord will cause horner syndrome because the sympathetic tract gets affected so there will not be any dilatation of the pupil so it will result in meiosis the tarsal muscles gets affected so they cannot elevate the eyelid it will become ptosis and sweating is lost resulting in facial hypohidosis thoracic cord lesions here are localized by the sensory level on the trunk and if present by the side of site of midline back pain so the useful markers of the sensory level on the trunk are t4 corresponds to nipple t7 corresponds to umbilicus a very important sign in thoracic cord is beaver sign that means the lesion is at t10 and below so when there's a lesion at t10 and below the lower abdominal muscles get affected so when the when the person sits up from lying down position the upper abdominal muscles will contact and pull the umbilicus upwards which is known as beaver sign so lesions at t10 paralyze the lower but not the upper abdominal muscles resulting in upward movement of the umbilicus when the abdominal wall contacts like sitting up from the lying down position lumbar cord l2 l3 l4 paralyzes flexion and adduction of the thigh weakens knee extension at the knee and abolishes the patellar re reflex l2 l3 l5 s1 paralyzes the movement of the foot and ankle flexion at the knee and extension of the thigh a very important movement is the dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion dorsiflexion is l5 that means person is able to walk on heels plantar flexion is s1 that means person is able to walk on toes so if l5 is weak person cannot if l5 is affected person cannot walk on heels if s1 is affected person cannot walk on toes very important point so l5 s1 paralyzes the movements of the foot and ankle flexion of the knee and extension of the thigh and abolishes the ankle jerk s1 and s2 sacral cord conus medullaris the conus medullaris is the tapered termination of the spinal cord comprising the sacral and single coccygeal segments the conus syndrome consists of bilateral saddle anesthesia s3 s4 s5 prominent bladder and bowel dysfunction urinary retention and incontinence with the lax anal tone and impotence and bulbo cavernous s2 s3 s4 and anal s4 s5 reflexes are lost muscle strength is largely preserved so conus medullaris is the tip of the spinal cord being affected usually the manifestations are s2 and below but sometimes s1 can get involved what we call as epiconus if that is the case then ankle jerk is also lost corda equina from latin horse tail from latin word horse tail is a bundle of spinal nerves and spinal nerve rootlets consisting of l2 and below the second to fifth lumbar nerve pairs and the first through fifth sacral nerve pairs and the coccygeal nerve all of which arise from the lumbar enlargement and the conus medullaris of the spinal cord cord equina they are the roots they are character imagine the disc collapse which goes and affects the roots so they are characterized by low back and radicular pain asymmetric leg weakness and sensory loss variable a reflexia in the lower extremities relate to sparing of bowel and bladder function the mass lesions in the lower spinal cord often produce a mixed clinical picture with elements of corda equina and conus medullaris lesions so what are the differences between conus medullaris and corda equina conus medullaris the tip of the spinal cord gets affected whereas corda equina the roots being affected so spontaneous pain it's not common in or severe bilateral and symmetric in perineum or thighs cord i could basically the roots are affected so that may, may be the most prominent symptom severe radicular in type unilateral or asymmetric sensory deficit in conus medullaris s2 and below gets affected so saddle distribution bilaterally usually symmetric dissociation of sensation since the spinothalamic tract crosses in the spinal cord so selectively spinothalamic tract can get affected so pain and temperature or lost touch position joint vibration is, is paired known as dissociation of sensation because of that there could be decubitus in cord equina it is a saddle distribution may be unilateral and asymmetric all forms affected no dissociation of sensations decubitus less common motor loss in conus medullaris it is symmetric most marked fasciculations may be present because of the anterior onsel involvement cord equina asymmetric more marked atrophy may occur but usually no fasciculations reflex loss 
only Achilles reflex is absent because of S1. Whereas cord equinus in the lesion is uh, below L2, L2 and below. Patellar and ankle reflexes may be absent. Bladder rectal sexual symptoms early and marked in conus medullaris, late and less marked in cord equina. Onset is sudden and bilateral in conus medullaris, gradual and unilateral in cord equina. Now we shall see the special patterns of the spinal cord uh, disease. Brown sequard, hemicord syndrome, central cord syndrome, anterior spinal artery syndrome, foramen magnum syndrome and intramedullary and extramedullary syndromes. Brown sequard syndrome is a hemisection of the spinal cord usually due to trauma. So the corticospinal tract and cord posterior column are affected. The manifestations are on the same side. The spinothalamic tract RF is also affected but the manifestations are on the opposite side because spinothalamic tract crosses over and goes to the opposite side. So brown sequard hemicord syndrome this consists of ipsilateral weakness, corticospinal tract and loss of joint position and vibration sense because of the posterior column involvement but with contralateral loss of pain and temperature sense spinothalamic tract one or two levels below the lesion. That could be segmental signs arise, such as radicular pain, muscle atrophy or loss of deep tendon reflexes which are unilateral. Central cord syndrome, the center of the spinal cord gets affected. Example, syringomyelia. So it affects the crossing spinal thalamic tract and therefore pain and temperature are affected. Position joint vibration sense are spared, which is known as dissociated sensory loss, which is very characteristic. And syringomyelia, usually it has got a predilection for cervical region and therefore usually the manifestations are confined uh, to the cervical region. So central cord syndrome, the syndrome, this syndrome results from selective damage to the gray matter nerve cells and crossing spinothalamic tract surrounding the central canal. In the cervical cord, the central cord syndrome produces arm weakness out of proportion to the leg weakness and a dissociated sensory loss, meaning loss of pain and temperature and sensations of the shoulders, lower neck and upper trunk cave distribution in contrast to preservation of light touch joint sense in these reasons. In these regions, spinal trauma, syringomyelia, and intrinsic cord tumors are the main causes. Anterior spinal artery syndrome. Infarction of the cord is generally the result of occlusion or diminished flow in this artery. The result is bilateral destruction, tissue destruction at several contiguous levels that spares the posterior column because posterior column is separated by the posterior spinal artery. All spinal cord functions, motor, sensory, and autonomic, are lost below the level of the lesion, with the striking exception of retained vibration position sense because they are supplied by the posterior spinal artery. Foramen magnum syndrome. In foramen magnum, in the middle oblong, the upper limb fibers cross above and the lower limb fibers cross below. So, there is a selective lesion in the distal part, the crossing leg fibers get affected, resulting in crural paresis. So, if a person has got paraplegia, True, most of the time it is because of the spinal cord, but sometimes even a, a cerebral lesion can cause paraplegia. It can occur at two levels. One in the medial prone part of the frontal lobe where the leg area is supplied with the anterior cerebral artery. So when both the anterior spinal arteries get affected, both the leg areas get affected, it is a cerebral cause of paraplegia. Second in the medial oblongata where the lower limb fibers, crossing lower limb fibers which are caudal to the upper limb fibers, if they get selectively affected, only the lower limb fibers get affected. Uh, resulting in paraparesis, the crural paresis. So it can occur at two levels, the cerebral cause of paraplegia. One in the medial part of the frontal lobe, second at the level of the middle oblongata. So foramen magnum syndrome, one, the crural paresis. Lesion in this area interrupts decussing, decussating permal tract fibers destined for the legs which cross caudal to those of the arms resulting in weakness of the legs known as crural para, para, paresis around the clock pattern. Before they have crossed, the upper limb fibers are laterally placed and the lower limb fibers are medially placed. So, compressive lesions near the foramen magnum may produce weakness of the ipsilateral shoulder and arm, followed by the weakness of the ipsilateral leg, and then the contralateral leg, and finally the contralateral arm, and around the clock of pattern weakness that may begin in any of the four limbs. There is typically suboxpital pain spreading to the neck and shoulders. Intramedullary and extramedullary symptoms. It is useful to differentiate intramedullary process arising within the substance of the cord from extra middle ones that lie outside the cord and compress the spinal cord or its vascular supply. Extra middle lesions, radicular pain is often the prominent and there's early sacral sensory loss because the sacral fibers are placed laterally in the spinothalamic tract and spastic weakness because the corticospinal fibers are also placed peripherally and spastic weakness in the legs with incontinence due to the superficial location of the corresponding sensory and motor fibers in the spinothalamic and corticospinal tracts. A further distinction is made between the extradural and intradural masses as the former are generally malignant and the later benign, neurofibroma being a common cause. 
consequently a long duration of symptoms favors an intradural lesion intramural lesions they tend to produce poor localizing burning pain rather than radicular pain and tend to spare sensations in the perineal and sacral areas sacral sparing because the spinothalamic tract the sacral sensations are laterally placed whereas an intramural lesion it first affects the upper limb fibers so the sacral fibers get spared reflecting the laminated configuration of the spinothalamic tract with sacral fibers outermost and corticospinal tract signs appear later so what are the differences between intramural and extramural lesions uh, the radicular pain is common and very early in extramural lesions because it affects the roots. The pain is radical pain is unusual in intramural lesions. Vertebral pain is also common in extramural lesions. Since it's outside the spinal cord, the bone which centers, which covers up the spinal cord can get affected. So there'll be vertebral pain. The funicular pain, uh, 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 non-specific pain is more common in intramural lesions, less common in extramural lesions. Upper motor neuron signs, yes, and they are late in intramural lesions. But since the corticospinal tracts are peripherally placed in extramural lesions, they are present and they are early. Whereas the lower motor neuron signs are prominent in intramural lesions because it is in the gray matter of the spinal cord, anterior horn cells. Whereas extramural lesions, uh, unusual if present segmental distribution. Parasthesia progression, if it's an intramural lesion, upper limb fibers get affected first, then the trunk, then the lower limb fibers. So it will be descending parasthesia. Whereas if it is an extramural lesion, the sacral fibers get affected first, then the trunk, and then the upper limb fibers. So it will be like an ascending parasthesia. The sphincter abnormalities are early with caudal lesions, conus medullaris, and cauda ichmina. They are late in extramural lesions. The trophic changes are common in intramural lesions, unusual in extramural lesions. Dissociated sensory loss is common in intramural lesion because it is a spinal cord lesion and the spinothalamic tract gets affected intermediate the crossing spinothalamic tract fibers gets affected so dissociated sensory loss is very common in intermediate lesions uh, unusual in extramural lesion sacral sparing of sensation is characteristic of intermediate lesions unusual in extramural lesions greater impairment of vibration than position sense is characteristic of intramural lesion and uh, unusual in extramural lesions yeah, these are all the important concepts of the spinal cord disorders and paraplegia and we need to know the anatomy of the spinal cord to understand the spinal cord uh, disorders and localization of paraplegia and all the important uh, concepts i put in a question answer format in my book focused neurology it is available on online from all uh, leading booksellers including amazon so uh, this book can be bought uh, online so these are all the important concepts of spinal cord disorders and I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as I enjoyed uh, delivering it. If you have any suggestions or comments, you can get back to me on my YouTube channel or email cklpm at gmail.com. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.